There are three guests here. Um, we'll take, play, uh, take um, a stance, if I may use that word, in the roundtable discussion about representation of trains and tracks in Holocaust memory. Memories about events, any event, um, but certainly and even as impactful as the Holocaust can differ widely. Um, if you get together with friends or family and talk about an event that you both or a number of you lived through, you will know that um, versions can vary um, enormously. And same goes for the memories of what the Holocaust was, how, how it was experienced. Um, so it is interesting then to look at the symbolic value of train tracks and um, how the value, the symbolic value of train tracks were shaped by all these memories linking together, contrasting at times, and how the faint traces or the physical tracks that are left here and there, remember Westerbork that I mentioned in the beginning, are given meaning and room to be there as silent witnesses um, of what happened. Three of you have looked at very different ways in which organizations, including, for example, Caserna del Saint, but also countries or people, have taken this to heart and shaped the memory of, um, of what happened in um, the death camps and the organization around it. And let me shortly introduce you. Frederik Rey, director of the Auschwitz Foundation since 2015. Verle um, van den Dalen in the middle, deputy general director and director of collections and research at, at um, Caserne del Sain. You're our host, to be fair. <laughs> and Hannes uh, van Weimelbeke, head of the memory service of the War Heritage Institute. So welcome, you can applaud them for being here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, welcome to the three of you. Um, you've each prepared um, a, a little um, talk about your expertise um, with some imagery and, and uh, footage even. Um, we'll be taking that on board throughout the discussion. And I want to invite you all to also throw in your questions uh, if and when you feel like it. But um, give us a couple of minutes to set the stage, as it were, and the theme that we'll be discussing. Um, and let me start by asking who decides that and if and when and how we memorialize the Holocaust and Auschwitz. Is there an easy answer to that question? Uh, it's a historical answer. Take the microphone. I have Just to? No, it should no, not you don't necessary. Okay. No, it's yeah. fine with that one. No. Perfect. We're in broadcasting mode. So, um, yeah, who decides? Mostly <coughs> politics, because if you take the example of uh, Auschwitz, it was the Communist uh, Party of Poland that had a lot to say uh, about, about this in history. They took uh, the numbers of victims uh, from the uh, Soviet Commission that was done in 1945 in, in Auschwitz already, and uh, this, uh, the numbers that were published in the Pravda, four million victims in Auschwitz were used till 1989 in the fall of communism in, in, in Poland. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what you uh, could read on the, on the, the, the stones mm -hmm. in, uh, in, at the International Monument in Birkenau. And when was that inaugurated? Was it clear straight after the war we're going to make this a space of a lieu de mémoire? Uh, it was more difficult than that. There was a museum from 1947 in uh, Auschwitz and also Birkenau was included, but Birkenau was not uh, memorialized uh, that, that, uh, that much in the beginning. Uh, the international monument that I mentioned was uh, inaugurated in 1967 for the 20 years of the museum. And the uh, inauguration speech of uh, Mr. Sirankiewicz was uh, one without the word Jew. So, and that was the argument of the Soviets and also of the communist par parties. Okay, saying that uh, there were Jews and non-Jews is a, is a fascist argument. We only speak about citizens. 
Polish citizens, uh, Soviet citizens, etc. And it's this way of looking that makes a memorialization in, in, at one moment, mm -hmm. which can change mm -hmm. what Over happened time. in, in, mm -hmm. in Auschwitz, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And Caserna del Sain was much, much, much later um, seen as a potential site for memorializing. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, it's, it only started, uh, the museum is from the opened officially to the larger public in 96, uh, but soon after the war you see annual commemorations that start. Mm -hmm. There are, is the one of the plaques outside of the, of the barracks that was there relatively soon, but it, it, the building itself was used by, uh, by the army for the longest time post-war, uh, after a short period of bringing uh, possible collaborators in there and locking them up in this place. And after the army left, I mean, the authentic interior of the camp during the war was long time gone. And uh, what, what, uh, what could be saved then was, was the whole building. It was something that was not at that point even considered as a memorial site or a museum. It was privatized. It was sold as apartments, mm -hmm. which is really bizarre if you think about it right now. And thank goodness that at that moment initiative was taken to at least safeguard the front wing mm -hmm. for memorialization and to um, erect the Jewish Museum of Deportation and Resistance there, um, first stone 95 and then 96 and then opening the up. doors uh, of the small museum and then 2012, uh, the, to, yeah, the inauguration of um, here, the, the big museum mm -hmm. across the street with then the memorial on the other side. Um, and and yeah. is there, is there um, has research been done um, about why it takes so long? Is there a um, theory about why it takes so long? And who owns the memory? Who, de who decides? You mentioned politicians. Of course, that's partly so here as mm -hmm. well. But then there are those who are directly connected with the whole story. There, everybody has an opinion after generations. Not always easy, I imagine. No, and, and in general, Belgium has been late for its Second World War Compared to other past mm -hmm. <laughs> to begin with. I mean, mm -hmm. we had to wait quite a while after the war until Sigasuma was uh, founded. Uh, in the Netherlands, they have it immediately after liberation. We lost precious time, years and years. For political and reasons, or what do you think? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not too sure, but it was. It was also our, our context. The facts after the war were were different in in, in the in the various countries. But then, specifically on the Shoah, um, the majority of the victims were not Belgian citizens. They did not have Belgian nationality in that sense. Um, and uh, there's a low survival rate. So, and the few survivors that are there are hoping that, that they can create a safe haven for others who cannot return home to then come to Belgium. So there's there's no um, pressure really on a political level from the victim groups on mm -hmm. to, to put it on the agenda. And, on, and politically, they're also not uh, a group that, that is very much at the interest of the politicians mm -hmm. at that moment either. I want to ask you, uh, working for NIOT, um, can, you, can you say something about uh, why uh, Holland was much quicker um, in taking on that memorialization? Yeah, the question, I mean, what was very important is that already in 1945, so immediately after the liberation, there was this institute, the NIOT, the, the, the predecessor of the NIOT. There was an individual, Rudy Jung, who uh, immediately recognized uh, the importance of bringing together all the available material, uh, photographs, and so on. He had a huge photograph collection also because he was so uh, soon to realize that this is important. So I think that, that played a major role in that regard, that people were immediately Sen made sensitive to the fact that it is important to collect these stories. But, but this was depending on one person, well, so to speak. Uh, he was the figurehead, say, yeah, but he was Yeah, it was aware. also a state institute okay. uh, back then already, so it was also led by the state. But at the same time, you see very similar processes as well 
regarding the fact that um, <coughs> the idea indeed that we should talk about like the Jewish people, we should talk about citizens in general, everyone had suffered, we had the hunger winter in the Netherlands, there were all kinds of aspects that everyone had suffered. So this particular focus on the Jews as victims was also much delayed in the Netherlands as, as well as anywhere mm -hmm. else in, in, in Europe, I would say. But yeah, indeed the fact mm -hmm. that we had this research institute quite quickly, I think, was very important. Yeah. You, uh, you um, take young people on a journey uh, to Auschwitz um, to make them understand what happened, history. Um, what are what is Auschwitz to them? Can can you can they see beyond the memorial, the lieu de mémoire, the place where things happened? Can they well, see it come alive, so to speak? Well, if you prepare them, yes. If not, well, they only see what's in Auschwitz one, for example, the musealization of of Auschwitz. And so if they're not prepared, they only, they don't look beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, so they really need to be prepared on what they are about to see and what's behind it. Uh, and the preparation, it takes, it takes time to really learn from the past. You can't do that in one or two history lessons. It takes, it's what we organize is the train of thousands. We go with the train to Auschwitz. But it's not only the train journey, it's a year-long preparatory project. And in that year, we, we, well, we, we let them see the different aspects and the different uh, perspectives of what happened in, in, that, in that sense. It's easier for, uh, for them to look beyond what only happened in Physical Auschwitz. objects and yeah, what indeed. there. Yeah. That is, we'll, we'll talk about that more uh, in a while, but okay. maybe this is a good time for you to, um, where is the little machine? I've got it here. Yes, to go through, <laughs> you, through what you prepared, <coughs> um, yes. to get back to the reality of it, and then the shifting perception and um, ideas. So talk us through yeah, what you uh, brought. So it was the meaning, uh, speaking of a symbol of progress, like a train was a, a beautiful symbol of progress uh, till... Uh, till the Second World War, because um, uh, I, I chose uh, this picture. It was uh, a picture from 1930s. It's on a, a margarine brand, uh, Echte Wagner, from Germany. Uh, and it was in these uh, albums you could, uh, uh, before Panini existed, you had those little pictures you, you could collect and uh, put in, a, in an album. This is a monorail, very futuristic. It looks like a TGV, no? Yes, <laughs> yes. So it was a very positive story, a very uh, modern story, of course. And like other uh, examples, like for example barbed wire or uh, crematoria, which were modern tools, they got a, a quite uh, negative uh, symbolic due to the, what happened during the Second mm -hmm. World War and the Holocaust. How do we go from that nice train to this? So I have to contextualize this picture because it was uh, often misused uh, also by uh, Holocaust uh, negationists. Uh. This is Dresden, this is the, between the, after the, the 15th February 1945, there was this big bombing of the allies of the city of Dresden. Those people here, those victims, are Germans, victims of those bombings. But what is interesting is this structure. You see, the, uh, we were talking about trails and tracks, and I wanted to talk a bit about the tracks in a very specific way, because the, here you see the tracks were piled, and the bodies were put on it to burn them, to incinerate them. This uh, methodology, if I can say so, uh, came from the extermination centers and from uh, one specific action that I will uh, explain in a few minutes. But this uh, was made by uh, people like uh, SS Hauptsturmführer Karl Streiber. Karl Streiber was the second commandant of uh, Travniki. For, uh, to explain, the extermination centers were guarded by uh, Ukrainian uh, volunteers, Hilfsfilliger, but also called Travniki Manner. And those people were, uh, they had a, a, a training in Travniki, which is a little, look, a little town, not even a town. We went there, there is nothing uh, to see anymore, <laughs> more or less. It's uh, not far from Lublin in Poland. 
This uh, method was used to burn the bodies in uh, the extermination centers, but also on other places where there were uh, mass graves. At one moment in history, the German authorities, the Nazi authorities in Berlin, they said we have to destroy all those uh, uh, traces of this, this crime. They were, they were of mm. course aware that it was a, cry, a crime. Uh, they they uh, said to everybody we do a noble job to the people that had to do it, but they still wanted to erase it. Here, I will explain it with uh, one, co it's to my opinion, the only memorial where uh, this action is symbolized with train tracks, with uh, railway train tracks. This is Bauchets, this is the new memorial in Bauchets, new, it's from 2004, it's already almost 20 years old, but uh, for a long time in Belgium there was uh, not that much. It was a quite forgotten place, no people visited uh, quite more. But if you go uh, in the concrete, uh, you, you have the concrete structure, the entrance of the memorial, where the train came by, uh, Johan showed us the, uh, the map of, uh, of uh, Belgium, the examination center. And if you go to the left, you see this. This is this memorial. We take a look uh, closer. You see here the, the trail tracks, the, the train tracks piled in a memorial. So this symbolizes the deportation, the arrival at uh, Belgium, but also the cremation of those mm. bodies. Just like that is this it's is a why very layered monument. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely, in, yeah. in, 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 in both senses, in, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, I use the picture of Dresden because about this action uh, we don't have that much pictures, mm -hmm. and uh, it's more or less one of the only in illustrations of, of this uh, kind of uh, destroying of evidence that we have. This is the picture that uh, uh, Johan uh, showed us also. It is Belgian. It was painted in 1960s uh, by Mr. Kolodjedic, uh, Václav Kolodjedic. And uh, he didn't go into the center because he, he, he was from Belgium. He was a Polish guy from Belgium. Uh, he worked at the railway station. Uh, but uh, he uh, didn't go into uh, the extermination center, so he painted what he had heard, what he what he knew for himself, and this is uh, the uh, extermi the after the extermination, after the burying in mass graves, those corpses were pulled out. This was an order from Berlin. Corpses were burned, destroyed, uh, crushed with uh, bone crushers, bone crushing machines, so that the, the crime was totally uh, erased. Mm -hmm. This was Action uh, 1005, it was ordered in 1942 and it uh, happened till 1945, beginning 1945, from the Baltic States till Yugoslavia and from Germany till the uh, uh, Soviet Union. Every, everywhere where there were mass graves. Main uh, leader of this, uh, the, pe the, the guy who had to do it, was SS Standardfeuer Paul Blobel. He was uh, an ancient uh, member of the Einsatzgruppe C that uh, uh, was in action in Kiev. We, we talked about uh, Ukraine today. It was already a, a very terrific place uh, in, in those days because in Kiev, Jews of Kiev were murdered in September 1941. Uh, 33,771 Jews were murdered in two days in Kiev. And then in Babi Yar Ravin, because that's the place where it occurred, the, this action, 2005, had to uh, be done again. <coughs> Paul Bobel went to Chelno, one of the extermination center, centers, Kumhof, where he had to uh, learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. And they, they had to find a cheap way to do it, to destroy those bodies. This is Paul Blobel, a few minutes before he was hanged in uh, 1951. 
He was uh, judged. He was judged uh, in, uh, in uh, at the Nuremberg uh, trial for the Einsatzgruppe, not for the, the big the big shots, uh, the, the first Nuremberg, but uh, one the, the Nuremberg trial for the Einsatzgruppe for his actions in uh, the Einsatzgruppe, not for his not action for in uh, Action 2005. Main places were Kulmov, as I mentioned, and Janowska. It's uh, not far from Lviv. It's a place where those commandos were formed to learn to burn in uh, bodies en masse. And there, with the, that knowledge, they had to go everywhere. The dirty work was, of course, done by uh, prisoners, by Jewish prisoners who were killed as Geheimnisträger afterwards. So you have here the, one of the pictures of Janowska with former uh, prisoners uh, after their liberation. Uh, and here one of the, the, the Knochenmühles, like the Nazi called it. So what I want to finish with, it's like um, Raoul Hilberg could make his monumental work about the extermination of Jews in Europe due to also documents from deportations. But another part of this whole story, the tracks, were used to erase the traces. And if we do not know today uh, how many victims in total there were, we, are not, uh, we cannot say it uh, for 100,000 precisely. Mm -hmm. And that's also due to Action 2005. Yeah. Mm. It's uh, powerful images that uh, you showed. And indeed, it's, it's very striking that the tracks that uh, were sign of progress that opened up the world to all of us, so to speak, when they uh, were first laid out, um, then turned into um, a trail of death, were turned into a trail of death. But then later you see, like I referenced Besserborg, but also here I think it was quite quickly business as usual and this focus on tracks was sort of Mm, yeah, left to to oblivion, or and even literally the tracks were just left to their own devices, grown over by weeds and stuff. Um, how come that only relatively recently there is this interest in tracks? Do you think is it too banal? It's almost too banal. That's that's what I was thinking. Like okay. Tracks were used, yes, while well, they were there and they were used, and so what? Is that a way to explain that? No, not too sure. I think I think it was also um, a lack of understanding and knowledge when when all that happened that it, that all the evidence could go away if it wasn't already destroyed during the war. Um, that after the war, it unfortunately took too long before. Um, society in general and decision makers uh, understood what what really the had happened, uh, the whole impact of mm -hmm. of, uh, of the Shoah and of all the crimes against humanity that happened during the Second World War. I think um, there was there was it, it took it took so long before the reality was also um, understood. Um, already by some of the victims mm -hmm. also, you know, who wanted to st still hope and believe that somebody could return in the first years after the war. And time goes by and it, it, it simply, we, we, we understood it mm -hmm. too late, I think. I mean, here especially, when you, when you look at the site here, it could have been preserved as a memorial altogether. The building, the tracks, the trains, the carriages, everything that had been used. And right now, the only thing we have is the historical uh, barracks that stand there. The walls are authentic, the contours are authentic, but everything around there has, has vanished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were too finished. late. That's not always the case, because mm. you prepared, and you can pass it on, um, <laughs> some slides um, yeah. to uh, give us an insight in other places where they looked at history through 
the lens of tracks and trains as well. Yeah, exactly. But also, um, as you notice, when you when you come to here, there is now the, the, the carriage that you can see in front of the museum. It used to be on the historically correct place right next to the barracks, uh, but it had to be moved. But where are those third class wagons? Where are the tracks? They're all gone. And the third class carriages are, to my feeling, something that, I mean, I, I, when I went with uh, the Auschwitz Foundation to Sobibor and we heard the quote about uh, a Dutch Jewish lady uh, leaving the train and still putting her makeup in order or her hair in order, whereas there was no place for her to sleep and to stay that night, she would, have, she would be killed the same day that the third class wagons being used was also a very deceiving thing to do. Mm -hmm. And and we we don't have it in our collective memory. It it, it, it seems to have vanished. Um, also um, the, the 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 trajectory that the trains followed, apart from Boort Meerbeek, there's to my knowledge not too many places, if at all in Belgium and elsewhere, that make the passerby aware of the fact that deportation trains pass through. Mm -hmm. I, do, I don't know of any. The stations uh, like Antwerp and Brussels, where also arrests have taken place and, and, and that have a history to tell, there's nothing there. So, um, and our research leads us to those tracks. I mean, Laurence gave the, 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 the letters, uh, quoted from the letters at the very beginning. We also uh, had a, a family, uh, Jean Yershi, who uh, ha always kept the last card that they received from his father, who he doesn't have any active memory of, because his father was deported on 15 September 42 with transport 10. <laughs> and he threw the card, these cards out of the train. And it's Jean Rosen in Dries Linter who found those images and put them into the mail. And we were able, uh, via Dossin and with the colleagues of the MAS, to trace the family of Jeanne Rosen, because she has uh, passed away since, and connect the families. And the people in Dries Linter, the mayor uh, and, and uh, historical society, all were like eager to learn about this fact and about, oh, were these trains passing by here? I mean, the fact that we don't do that in Belgium sufficiently, I think, I mean, the whole research that is going to be carried out about, about uh, the, the involvement of the NMBS, we, we also had then people from the historical society, the, the elder generation saying, you know, oh, and Jos Hacker, who documented Caserne Dossin, the Dossin barracks, he wrote about our region. He misinterpreted uh, the names on the signs, so he, the, it's not exactly correct the, the name places that he f remembered after his flight. But we know the people who helped him, who were workers of the railroad system. And so all of a sudden, you had this momentum on the trajectory of the train. And there are so many towns and villages in Belgium that could work with this, that could in that way convey history, because we've also seen in the second panel the uh, personal stories and, and, and the personal narrative is what can convey this history alive, yeah. and, and keep it alive. So that's a, 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 a plea for a <laughs> bottom-up chapter mm -hmm. in your study, uh, Nico Aders, <laughs> as well. Absolutely. Yeah. But then also, um, the, our image of trains and, and, and the Shoah is, is obviously negative from our perspective. But going to the US, I also was visiting uh, this center the Union uh, Terminal in Cincinnati, the big railroad station, which became a museum center with like various museums on one side. Mm -hmm. And then the Holocaust Museum, which used to be at the Jewish school, was preparing its relocation when I met uh, the director to this place. And what, what, what I found very interesting is the first two sentences of their um, um, happiness of being in a station, they were actually being happy because to them it was a symbol of hope because that's where survivors returned after the war and built their lives. And so in that sense, it was like from a, from a European perspective to like be happy to be located at a station was something 
totally counterintuitive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then there they were. And I mean, I can, uh, if, if there is time, we can listen to the director uh, quickly explaining that about the survivors. She's explaining about why she's so happy that they are in, in this place. Welcome to the Nancy and David Wolf Holocaust and Humanity Center, newly uh, located at Cincinnati's Union Terminal. We are the newest museum here at Union Terminal. Okay. The museum both shares the history and lessons of the Holocaust and also um, hopefully inspires us to think about the present and the future as well. The graphic novel mural behind me shares vignettes of local survivors and other eyewitnesses. Um, we hope our visitors really connect with the authenticity of this building. Many Many of our survivors arrived here, and we also know many, one in five, World War II servicemen and women came through this building. And so sharing those stories and uh, getting our visitors to reflect on the lessons of the Holocaust is what our work and museum is all about. Okay. So that's, that's her vision then on why they're happy to go to the station. And so for me, that was, that was something, something new. An eye opener. Yeah, yeah something, mm -hmm. something different. Um, but then at the same time, there's also, uh, I don't know in to what extent you, are, uh, you know the Tzedek, the memorial in Milan. The memorial in Milan is uh, installed in the station of Milan, a fascist uh, style building from 1931 and um, so we can we can uh, watch this without sound uh, yeah. while I speak okay. so the lady is explaining uh, in Italian so we're not going to listen to the Italian about the memorial it's located in this fascist built uh, station uh, built in 31 and where Jews were gathered there was where the postal uh, office were and what you see there is the place where they would load the postal uh, carriages like uh, and then they would take them one by one up to the tracks to then be uh, uh, leave uh, leave the station so the station that was also used for passengers um, but you see behind the lady there that says that it's not uh, for passenger use but during the second world war Jews were brought there in this postal uh, area on so on the on the ground level of the station where no passengers would come and the deportation trains were loaded in these carriages that were normally used for the mail one uh, carriage by one with this elevator system going up and therefore being put on the tracks as regular traffic in the freight station track, uh, uh, and, uh, and person trains yeah. would just leave the station as it was and no one would notice and actually, nobody that would notice that this was actually people that were being brought up instead of mail it's like horrible to think about it, but the way they integrated in their commemoration and memorialization is that uh, you enter this, this museum, this memorial, and you see in big letters indifferencia, you see the library which uses hanging systems, so to kind of work with the vibration of the trains passing above it because you hear and you feel the trains when you, when you visit this, this, this memorial or when you work there in a meeting, then you, you just have to kind of um, stop your conversation, your guided tour, your meeting every time a train passes above your heads and goes too loud. But the, the symbolism, the fact of being in such an authentic place and leaving the sound and the rumble as it is, is just extremely, extremely powerful. Um, and it made me think about, I just wanted to bring those two examples to the fore on the one of like the authenticity and this, this uh, place. And on the other hand, uh, that, that symbol of hope of the station, mm -hmm. which was also the case for many of the people who came to build their lives in Belgium, Jewish people who have their first memories about Antwerp train station and the big hall and all of it. So I just wanted to make a plea for more awareness of those places, for more awareness in these places around the trajectories of the, the trains, but also to, to um, uh, focus on the fact that the context also matters and that therefore we also have to keep our eyes open for that. So, but the authenticity and authentic places are uh, 
of key mm. importance. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, that that's that's something where there's a lot of work and a lot of possibilities to do, especially now that the generation of the direct witnesses is no longer there, mm -hmm. to have a local approach and a very, very mm -hmm. yeah, authentic approach. And peel away the layers that have grown over uh, traces of, of history, I think, and see uh, places in three dimensions or more dimensions uh, from Technicolor to Sepia and back or black and white. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. um, let's go to, to uh, Hannes because um, this this whole idea, it, it feels like a now or never moment in mm -hmm. saving what traces there are left that we often don't know of or are not aware of, not, not aware enough of. Um, do you share that feeling? Is it? Is it? Yeah, absolutely. And and it, maybe it's even a bit late to organize uh, in our uh, well what we do uh, because we used to work a lot with testimonies with people who survived Auschwitz, but also other concentration camps. Those people aren't there anymore. And what we saw. We invited schools. We had we had special school programs in which we visited, or uh, the Caserne d'Orsay, or Brendonk. And after that, there was a survivor of Auschwitz or uh, Buchenwald or uh, Brendonk that came to speak uh, with uh, with the youngsters about what they what they lived, mm -hmm. what they made through. And when these testimonies, when these people weren't there anymore, there are hardly one or two survivors uh, still alive. So it's hard to really w capture what they lived, what we're, what they lived through, and translate that to to youngsters. Therefore, we organize such a, a train of thousands. Mm -hmm. uh, the train of thousand. Well, w obviously, we use a train. Uh, <laughs> That's, That's one of the reasons <coughs> why you're invited. Indeed. <laughs> uh, and, well, the comfort of this, this train journey is completely different than what the, those people made through. One thing is more or less the same. That's the time people are in a train, which, well, most young people sometimes take a train. And a train ride here in Belgium, it takes, what, Maximum one hour, maybe two hours if it's far away, <laughs> or maybe longer. <laughs> if there are no delays, well, if there are delays, uh, this train ride uh, takes 26 hours. So <coughs> during these 26 hours, well, the youngsters really feel what it must have been for those people, even if the circumstances are completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, and 26 hours isn't a lot compared to what most depo deportees had to, had to make through, because from Belgium it's, it, it took three days, mm -hmm. yeah. three, day, three days and three nights. We only, well, it takes us only one day and one mm -hmm. night. So, and after 26 hours, lots of those young people say, well, that was tiring. <laughs> e they were bored, for the the <laughs> maybe partly, and it was just a long road. Yeah, yeah. a very long road. And, and even when they come off the train, their legs are shaking because, well, they still have the feeling to be on the train. So the fact that we take a train really makes them see that well, that train journey of those people that were deported, that must have been terrible. Yeah, so you make it a physical experience Indeed. almost to, to activate um, their imagination yeah. in terms of what it could be like. Th a thousand, a train of thousand, a thousand, why, how, who are they, the uh, answers you get together? Well, first of all, a thousand people because from Belgium there were, all, all the transports were about 1,000 people that were deported. So the thousand youngsters is very symbol symbolic, uh, but it's not just only Belgians that we are taking to uh, to Auschwitz. Uh, here's some facts. Yep. Uh, we we take 15 different nationalities because uh, it's the deportations to Auschwitz, there weren't just Belgians that were deported <coughs> to, to Auschwitz, there were lots of different uh, 
uh, of people from different nationalities. So we try to uh, bring as much different nationalities as possible no. on the train. Uh, not only as a symbol, but also to exchange between the youngsters, because all these different people, all these people from different nationalities, all have different stories, different backgrounds, and different histories. And on different angles on history, and different as angles, Anisha Gishinska pointed indeed. out. Yeah. So, and we want to actively, uh, well, try to make exchanges possible during the train ride yeah. between all these different and people. Stimulate debate. Um, we're living in 2022. Fake news is a big thing. Mm -hmm. um, do you f did, did you notice a change in that regard over the past couple of uh, train rides you organized? Do, do young people react differently, more skeptically maybe? Uh, well, absolutely. In 2012, f fake news was very marginal. Uh, it's, well, with the el election of Donald Trump in the United States, it's a thing that really came, well, to the classrooms also, to, to the daily lives. And we, we see, in fact, that youngsters sometimes ask questions that 10 years ago weren't there mm -hmm. on, did it really happen? Uh, or, or do we have to believe some, <coughs> some facts or historians? So we have a lot more work on that to do than 10 years ago. I see. And how do you do that? The uh, one dollar question? Well, f we, uh, we, before the train really starts, uh, we, we prepare them. It's inevitable that they have to be prepared. If not, uh, f such five days because it takes five days I, I wouldn't say that it's useless but first of all they have to know the history so what we do is do prepar preparatory visits to uh, the Caserne de Saint, to Brendonk, to the Army Museum where our institutions is, uh, is located uh, then we go to schools with a present, uh, PowerPoint presentation on, well, the beginning of the concentration camps and how it came to be that Auschwitz and other concentration camps or uh, extermination centers uh, were erected. Uh, and then we, we go into discussion with them. And during these discussions, well, sometimes strange questions uh, come to the foreground things we don't even think about. Others, other youngsters know much more and go much more into detail. And, and it's during these discussions that we can really focus on what, what they are living through, what their world is. Mm -hmm. um, you say, okay, we, we put together youngsters from different backgrounds, different countries. Do you feel um, that some feel more um, feel as if it's more their history than others? Um, well, I remember the past edition, which is in 2000. Pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, yeah. indeed. <laughs> we should have organized the train of 2020 in the month of May, but we all know what happened. So in uh, 2015, we, uh, I remarked that, uh, for instance, the Italian youngsters were much more into... Uh, much more, well, I wouldn't say prepared, but their background was really different. When the train stopped, they started singing uh, resistant, all old resistance songs, <laughs> which was quite nice. It, but it, I, I can't imagine that Belgian youngsters even know resistance songs. So the 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 background of the different nationalities really plays plays a role. Yeah, and the way they're being taught history, Indeed. I guess, in school yeah. and what is that for. Do any of you have a question you want to put to one of the panelists? Just a little question for uh, So you can confirm that these transports of Jews uh, took place among the normal uh, train traffic with uh, passengers in Belgium or the Netherlands? Or was it just in the night so that <coughs> no one could see the, these uh, kind of transports? 
Well, the museum that I was talking about, that's in Milan, that's Italy. So, um, and in Belgium, uh, the, the transports used the same tracks as the other trains. And so therefore, um, the people working on the railroad system, like these people who testified for Dries Linter, yeah. they said they knew when there, it was a train with Jews passing by. They knew this because also all the all the letters that were thrown out of the train gave evidence to the fact that this was, that there were people even when it was like uh, no longer the third class wagons but but the, the other wagons that were used. So in that sense, um, I'm not going to say that every citizen knew and could recognize a train because typically they would not go through during rush hour and they were not mm -hmm. priority transport so they were often put on a side track and they left very early in the morning so as not to attract too much attention so it was not as if it was like publicized you know here's a train a deportation train not at all but but it's it's it was not uh unknown by people working on the railroad system or by people uh, living by along people the trajectory. Uh, who, who left uh, with their houses uh, alongside the, the tracks, perhaps, uh, they also noticed it. Uh, Possibly, because, for example, this Jean Rosen was a teenager when she found the little card and when she decided to put her name address on it and a stamp and to mail it. And that is for many of the people who have been deported the last sign of life that we have. And for some survivors, it is uh, 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 something that testifies about their deportation and the mm -hmm. fact that they uh, succeed, that that has been delivered. How many of those letters have been lost or not mailed? That we do not know, of course. but. Uh, those who did find them knew about what were, knew that these people were in trains and that they were transported. Yes. Anyone else? No. Last question. I would like to, to ask um, Frederick Rai <coughs> a question regarding his opinion on the the mass tourism, mm -hmm. if you can call it like that. I don't know and the perhaps commercialization of the Holocaust memory in Auschwitz? Well, it's uh, multi-layered because, uh, of course, uh, Johan already talked about it. When you go to Krakow, you're offered a one-day visit to uh, Auschwitz. You see it in a, in a very fast way. You don't see everything, of course. Eventually, you can join the Vilitska salt mines after it, uh, creating a wrong ID. But uh, yeah, you have different people uh, that go on with different purposes to those places. Sometimes people say uh, it's just a check on a checklist that I have to do. Some people go there because they're, it's a family. It's a family thing, or people are interested, like we do, like historians go there. Uh, so yeah, the mass um, the mass uh, visits on in Auschwitz. It's sometimes a problem because a lot of people when you go to Auschwitz one, it's not it's not easy. It's it uh, it's a problem uh, for for that place because sometimes you have to wait before entering a, a barrack. Uh, it's a queue. Uh, it's it's yeah. I don't like to say it that way, but it's sometimes a bit like Disneyland. You have to wait to go into an attraction, and that's not the meaning of that place. You don't have that problem in in uh, Birkenau that much mm -hmm. because it's much bigger. But uh, if you get there to commemorate, <coughs> if you don't, if you want to be a bit alone uh, in Auschwitz, one, it's not the be very best uh, place. Other places are. Uh, uh, not that well known, like uh, like we mentioned uh, in Belgium, uh, I think there are uh, thirty thousand visitors more or less uh, each year now. It's not that much. Uh, it's 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 very good for them because uh, it's a lot much uh, a lot more than uh, some years ago. But uh, in comparing to Auschwitz, it's nothing. And maybe most people don't know about Bergets. Sobibor even even less because it's middle of the woods, uh, Treblinka, Chemno. When you go there, then uh, if you want to be alone, you're at the right place. So on the other side, 
mass interest in those places can uh, yeah can can challenge the public and when the public is interested sometimes it's a, it's it's better also for science because when you have i give one example uh, the Holocaust uh, movie in six parts with uh, Meryl Streep from the 70s or the, the movie of uh, Mr. Spielberg, uh, uh, Schindler's List. A lot of people see it, a lot of people talk about it and then there, are, uh, there, there is a, a public interest of, of these topics. And when there is a public interest, in a, in a general way, there is more money to do research. And then it's a win-win. But yeah, you have to take the the public, the big public thing with it, unfortunately. Yeah, but also, I mean, it's a bit of a paradox because you want the public to be informed. Absolutely. As, as we talked about with uh, Alicia Geschinska, it's also in uh, the light of democracy and how the awareness of the importance of those kind of values. So that's, that's absolutely, absolutely true. But the uh, problem with the movie is it creates uh, an image of something mm -hmm. that it's very hard to disconstruct afterwards, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. even if it's not true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the tricky part. When uh, when we look at the movies or even documentaries, sometimes you say, oh, this is, uh, yeah, like a, a historian, you're getting uh, a bit angry but mm -hmm. yeah you have to yeah. live with it <laughs> everything refers back to uh, everything because now I'm reminded again of Kuhn Arts's uh, contribution today about the importance of uh, stories in how to pass on the memory um, I, I want to thank the three of you for being here and sharing your work and thoughts on memorializing um, this um, impactful part of history and what we talked about all day. So Frederik Ferle and Hannes, thank you very much. Thank you.